Chapter 17 of The Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 17 On the Deck of the Kincaid. When Mugambi had turned back into the jungle with the pack, he had a definite purpose in view. It was to obtain a dugout wherewith to transport the beast of Tarzan to the side of the Kincaid. Nor was he long in coming upon the object which he sought. Just at dusk he found a canoe moored to the bank of a small tributary of the Ugambi at a point where he had felt certain that he should find one. Without loss of time he plied his hideous fellows into the craft and shoved out into the stream. So quickly had they taken possession of the canoe that the warrior had not noticed that it was already occupied. The huddled figures sleeping in the bottom had entirely escaped his observation in the darkness of the night that had now fallen. But no sooner were they afloat than a savage growling from one of the apes directly ahead of him in the dugout attracted his attention to a shivering and cowering figure that trembled between him and the great anthropoid. To Mugambi's astonishment, he saw that it was a native woman. With difficulty he kept the ape from her throat, and after a time succeeded in quelling her fears. It seemed that she had been fleeing from marriage with an old man she loathed, and had taken refuge for the night in the canoe she had found upon the river's edge. Mugambi did not wish her presence, but there she was, and rather than lose time by returning her to the shore, the black permitted her to remain on board the canoe. As quickly as his awkward companions could paddle the dugout downstream toward the Ugambi and the Kincaid, they moved through the darkness. It was with difficulty that Mugambi could make out the shadowy form of the steamer, but as he had it between himself and the ocean, it was much more apparent than to one upon either shore of the river. As he approached it, he was amazed to note that it seemed to be receding from him, and finally he was convinced that the vessel was moving downstream. Just as he was about to urge his creatures to renewed efforts to overtake the steamer, the outline of another canoe burst suddenly into view not three yards from the bow of his own craft. At the same instant, the occupants of the stranger discovered the proximity of Mugambi's horde, but they did not at first recognize the nature of the fearful crew. A man in the bow of the oncoming boat challenged them just as the two dugouts were about to touch. For answer came the menacing growl of a panther, and the fellow found himself gazing into the flaming eyes of Sheeta, who had raised himself with his forepaws upon the bow of the boat, ready to leap upon the occupants of the other craft. Instantly Rokoff realized the peril that confronted him and his fellows. He gave a quick command to fire upon the occupants of the other canoe, and it was this volley and the scream of the terrified native woman in the canoe with Mugambi that both Tarzan and Jane had heard. Before the slower and less skilled paddlers in Mugambi's canoe could press their advantage and effect the boarding of the enemy, the latter had turned swiftly downstream and were paddling for their lives in the direction of the Kincaid, which was now visible to them. The vessel, after striking upon the bar, had swung loose again into a slow-moving eddy, which returns upstream close to the southern shore of the Ugambi, only to circle out once more and joined the downward flow a hundred yards or so farther up. Thus the Kincaid was returning Jane Clayton directly into the hands of her enemies. It so happened that as Tarzan sprang into the river the vessel was not visible to him, and as he swam out into the night he had no idea that a ship drifted so close at hand. He was guided by the sounds which he could hear coming from the two canoes. As he swam he had vivid recollections of the last occasion upon which he had swum in the waters of the Ugambi, and with them a sudden shudder shook the frame of the giant. But, though he twice felt something brush against his legs from the slimy depths below him, nothing seized him, and of a sudden he quite forgot about crocodiles in the astonishment of seeing a dark mass loom suddenly before him, where he had still expected to find the open river. So close was it that a few strokes brought him up to the thing, when to his amazement his outstretched hand came in contact with the ship's side. As the agile ape man clambered over the vessel's rail, there came to his sensitive ears the sound of a struggle at the opposite side of the deck. Noiselessly he sped across the intervening space. The moon had risen now, and though the dark was still banked with clouds, a lesser darkness enveloped the scene than that which had blotted out all sight earlier in the night. His keen eyes, therefore, saw the figures of two men grappling with a woman. That it was the woman who had accompanied Anderson toward the interior he did not know, though he suspected as much, as he was now quite certain that this was the deck of the Kincaid upon which chance had led him. But he wasted little time in idle speculation. There was a woman in danger of harm from two ruffians, which was enough excuse for the ape-man to project his giant thews into the conflict without further investigation. The first that either of the sailors knew that there was a new force at work upon the ship was the falling of a mighty hand upon a shoulder of each. 
As if they had been in a grip of a flywheel, they were jerked suddenly from their prey. "'What means this?' asked a low voice in their ears. They were given no time to reply, however, for at the sound of that voice the young woman had sprung to her feet and, with a little cry of joy, leaped toward their assailant. "'Tarzan!' she cried. The ape-man hurled the two sailors across the deck, where they rolled, stunned and terrified, into the scuppers upon the opposite side, and, with an exclamation of incredulity, gathered the girl into his arms. Brief, however, were the moments for their greeting. Scarcely had they recognized one another than the clouds above them parted to show the figures of a half-dozen men clambering over the side of the Kincaid to the steamer's deck. Foremost among them was the Russian. As the brilliant rays of the equatorial moon lighted the deck, and he realized that the man before him was Lord Greystoke, he screamed hysterical commands to his followers to fire upon the two. Tarzan pushed Jane behind the cabin near where they had been standing, and with a quick bound started for Rokoff. The men behind the Russian, at least two of them, raised their rifles and fired at the charging ape-man. But those behind them were otherwise engaged, for up the monkey ladder in their rear was thronging a hideous horde. First came five snarling apes, huge man-like beasts with bared fangs and slavering jaws, and after them a giant black warrior, his long spear gleaming in the moonlight. Behind him again scrambled another creature, and of all the horrid horde it was this they most feared, Sheeta the panther with gleaming jaws agape and fiery eyes blazing at them in the mightiness of his hate and of his blood-lust. The shots that had been fired at Tarzan missed him, and he would have been upon Rokoff in another instant had not the great coward dodged backward between his two henchmen, and, screaming in hysterical terror, bolted forward toward the forecastle. For the moment Tarzan's attention was distracted by the two men before him, so that he could not at the time pursue the Russian. About him the apes and Mugambi were battling with the balance of the Russian's party. Beneath the terrible ferocity of the beast, the men were soon scampering in all directions, those who still lived to scamper, for great fangs of the apes of Akut and the tearing talons of Sheeta already had found more than a single victim. Four, however, escaped and disappeared into the forecastle, where they hoped to barricade themselves against further assault. Here they found Rokoff, and, enraged at his desertion of them in their moment of peril, no less than at the uniformly brutal treatment it had been his wont to accord them, they gloated upon the opportunity now offered them to revenge themselves in part upon their hated employer. Despite his prayers and groveling pleas, therefore, they hurled him bodily out upon the deck, delivering him to the mercy of the fearful things from which they themselves had just escaped. Tarzan saw the man emerge from the forecastle, saw and recognized his enemy, but another saw him even as soon. It was Sheeta, and, with grinning jaws, the mighty beast slunk silently toward the terror-stricken man. When Rokoff saw what it was that stalked him, his shrieks for help filled the air, as with trembling knees he stood, as one paralyzed, before the hideous death that was creeping upon him. Tarzan took a step toward the Russian, his brain burning with a raging fire of vengeance. At last he had the murderer of his son at his mercy. It was his right to avenge. Once Jane had stayed his hand that time that he sought to take the law into his own power, and meet to Rokoff the death that he had so long merited. But this time none should stay him. His fingers clenched and unclenched spasmodically as he approached the trembling Russ, beast-like and ominous as a brood of prey. Presently he saw that Sheeta was about to forestall him, robbing him of the fruits of his great hate. He called sharply to the panther, and the words, as if they had broken a hideous spell that had held the Russian, galvanized him into sudden action. With a scream he turned and fled toward the bridge. After him pounced Sheeta the panther, unmindful of his master's warning voice. Tarzan was about to leap after the two when he felt a light touch upon his arm. Turning, he found Jane at his elbow. "'Do not leave me,' she whispered. "'I am afraid.' Tarzan glanced behind her. All about were the hideous apes of a cut. Some, even, were approaching the young woman with bared fangs and menacing guttural warnings. The ape-man warned them back. He had forgotten for the moment that these were but beasts, unable to differentiate his friends and his foes. Their savage natures were roused by their recent battle with the sailors, and now all flesh outside the pack was meat to them. Tarzan turned again toward the Russian, chagrin that he should have to forego the pleasure of personal revenge, unless the man should escape Sheeta. But as he looked he saw that there could be no hope of that. The fellow had retreated to the end of the bridge, where he now stood trembling and wide-eyed, facing the beast that moved slowly toward him. The panther crawled with belly to the planking, uttering uncanny mouthings. Rokoff stood as though petrified, his eyes protruding from their sockets, his mouth agape, and the cold sweat of terror clammy upon his brow. Below him, upon the deck, he had seen the great anthropoids, 
and so had not dared to seek escape in that direction. In fact, even now, one of the brutes was leaping to seize the bridge rail to draw himself up to the Russian side. Before him was the panther, silent and crouched. Rokoff could not move. His knees trembled. His voice broke in inarticulate shrieks. With a last piercing wail he sank to his knees, and then Sheeta sprang. Full upon the man's breast the tawny body hurled, tumbling the Russian to his back. As the great fangs tore at the throat and chest, Jane Clayton turned away in horror, but not so Tarzan of the apes. A cold smile of satisfaction touched his lips. The scar upon his forehead that had burned scarlet faded to the normal hue of his tanned skin and disappeared. Rokoff fought furiously but futilely against the growling, rending fate that had overtaken him. For all his hideous crimes he was punished in the brief moment of the hideous death that had claimed him at last. After his struggle ceased, Tarzan approached, at Jane's suggestion, to wrest the body from the panther and give what remained of it decent human burial. But the great cat rose snarling above its kill, threatening even the master it loved in its savage way, so that rather than kill his friend of the jungle, Tarzan was forced to relinquish his intentions. All that night Sheeta the panther crouched upon the grisly thing that had been Nicholas Rokoff. The bridge of the Kincaid was slippery with blood. Beneath the brilliant tropical moon the great beast feasted, until, when the sun rose the following morning, there remained of Tarzan's great enemy only gnawed and broken bones. Of the Russian's party, all were accounted for except Paulvich. Four were prisoners in the Kincaid's forecastle. The rest were dead. With these men, Tarzan got up steam upon the vessel, and, with the knowledge of the mate, who happened to be one of those surviving, he planned to set sail in quest of Jungle Island. But as the morning dawned, there came with it a heavy gale from the west, which raised a sea into which the mate of the Kincaid dared not venture. All that day the ship lay within the shelter of the mouth of the river, for, though night witnessed the lessening of the wind, it was thought safer to wait for daylight before attempting the navigation of the winding channel to the sea. Upon the deck of the steamer the pack wandered without let or hindrance by day, for they had soon learned through Tarzan and Mugambi that they must harm no one upon the Kincaid, but at night they were confined below. Tarzan's joy had been unbounded when he learned from his wife that the little child who had died in the village of Maganwazam was not their son. Who the baby could have been, or what had become of their own, they could not imagine. And, as both Rokoff and Paulvich were gone, there was no way of discovery. There was, however, a certain sense of relief in the knowledge that they might yet hope. Until positive proof of the baby's death reached them, there was always that to buoy them up. It seemed quite evident that their little Jack had not been brought aboard the Kincaid. Anderson would have known of it had such been the case, but he had assured Jane time and time again that the little one he had brought to her cabin the night he aided her to escape was the only one that had been aboard the Kincaid since she lay at Dover. End of chapter 17